Um, I'm here to talk with Scott about investing in diamond and selling a business and then investing in real estate, private equity, and then building a new startup around that. And, and, um, and I had an amazing conversation. Hope you love it as well. This is the Note Closer Show, where you get the latest developments in distressed note investing and learn the secrets of how you can control millions of dollars worth of property for pennies on the dollar. Get educated and entertained by someone who has closed thousands of deals and lives to support you in achieving the same. Now, here's your host, CEO of We Close Notes, Scott Carson. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everybody. Welcome to this episode of the Note Closer Show. As always, Scott Carson, excited to be here with today. We've got a very special guest. This guy is, he's an entrepreneur with a passion for really working with investors, but he's built a tech company that's really helping so many investors out there. And I know we got so many uh, real estate investors, but I know that uh, so many of you guys out there in our Note Nation, and I'm not only just investing in real estate, you've also got your portfolio of stocks and other things you're doing. And I'm really excited to have our special guest here. He, this guy is a former Navy officer in the Israeli Navy, uh, and he revolutionized uh, a, a, a diamond display company or technology to disrupt the whole global diamond industry out there, okay? Uh, and so with that, he became a, a, an active and passive real estate investor. He's out of Israel, Israel which is, uh, most of us don't know, it's our third biggest audience besides the United States and Canada. No way. Really, yeah, very much so. We get a lot of uh, uh, Jewish folks invest in the United States and listen to the podcast for sure. So we're honored to have, you may have heard him there, Litan Yahav uh, join us here. And he is the CEO and founder of Visor. And so uh, welcome to the Nucleus Show, uh, Litan. I appreciate it. Sorry for interrupting the introduction. I appreciate being, appreciate you and thank you for having me on the show. Yeah, no, no, no problem at all. Hey, it's good to be excited about stuff there. But <laughs> You know, I have to ask you, how do you get into disrupting the, the you know, the diamond world? I mean, that just doesn't, something you hear about taking place. Because this <laughs> and that kind of, and we'll get into the real estate stuff, but that, when you put that talk about your bio, it's like, whoa, it, cause isn't that kind of a closely guarded industry where you really got to know that, and be in the know in that industry to do anything? Or no, yeah, how's that, that kind of work? You, you have no idea. It's it's such a crazy industry. So a little background on that. So I, I, I after the military, sort of, I, went travel the world a bit and then went to school. And then during our last, my last year of study, sort of part of this entrepreneurship program where sort of a group of, a group of people need to think about an idea and build a, a team around it and, and sort of like build a startup with, with throughout studies. And sort of, we did, we did um, a friend of a friend put a, took us around a diamond exchange. And now I don't know many people, if anyone knows, but Israel is like a very big diamond hub for trading and manufacturing diamonds. It was a lot bigger back in the day, but now it's st it's still there. India is taking basically over everything. Um, but sort of a, a friend a friend of ours took us around the diamond exchange and it's like, you go in this super secure building, like you've never seen, like in the military, you don't see this type of level of security and you go to the super secure building. And then when you go through security and you're, you're, you're down and you're in the building, it's like, whoosh, you go like 50 years back in time. In, in, a, in, in if you try to imagine a building like long hallways and doors throughout the hallway with notes written in handwriting saying, I'm looking to buy this and this diamond. I'm looking to sell this and this diamond. And, and then people walking through these hallways with suitcases full of diamonds, just knocking on doors and trying to sell and buy diamonds. And there's a whole trade of diamonds from like a, a, a B2B wholesale type. Um, and it was really old fashioned. Just, you know, I, I think the advantage of coming from what the, from outside of an industry that's such an old-fashioned one, you don't have the inhibitions or like or the limits to hey, wait, this can't be done. Um, and we had a lot of like a lot of rejects when we were like I like researching this and like people telling us I want to smell the diamond before I buy it. I want to see the life of the diamond. Anyway, so yeah, we we stumbled upon that industry and, and fascinated by how different it was from the way other things are happening in the world. And so, yes, yeah, so that's how we reached that. Um, very lucky. Uh, and um, it went well. <laughs> how long did it take you, uh, you know, I, and I understand the entrepreneurship program. I, you know, I studied entrepreneurship, but in my, my master's and MBA, stuff like that, and working through that. And yeah, you, you come up with things. 
but that's so many older industries out there are like, well, you can't do it. And then the answer they ask the question is, why can't you? Well, that's just how we've always done business. You know what exactly. I mean? Exactly. And we see that too in the, in the distressed the real estate space. Oh, you can't do that. Well, why can't we do that? Well, it's because this is how we've done it forever. And, you know, it's the old kind of philosophy. Of, oh, I walked up 20 miles to and from school or from working 20 feet of snow. You can't get around all this kind of limited beliefs in a lot of cases. And I, I'm, I don't know how many, you said you got rejected a lot, but then it finally changed. What, was there a specific point where that kind of revolutionized in your mind or people started catching on to what you're really trying to put uh, to, to do? Well, I mean, I, I don't know if real estate works the same way in that sense, but sort of the diamond industry is a very family run. These are very family run businesses. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the kids that were born with iPhones in their hand were starting to take lead of the company and say, hey, I want, I mean, this makes a lot more sense than how things used to be. And so we were really like a timing, as I say, timing is everything. The timing was like, we were, like I said, we were lucky to, to be there at the, the, the right place, the right time. And there was a lot of hard work by our side. We did a lot of like footwork to educate this market that 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 what we're doing is good. Like one one of the one of the hacks we did, and I think this is relevant for a lot of a lot of industries. Is sort of when you create when you go downstream and downstream. I mean, we went to the manufacturers of diamonds, and some of the, some of them we offered our services for free. And what we do is we'd they'd bring us their their diamonds, we'd photograph them in our machines, and then they'd receive a link for these diamonds. And, and it's a sort of a, imagine like a, a, a web page with this amazing image of a diamond rotating and you can interact with it. And it was a watermark with our name on it. And so when that diamond manufacturer in India would send that image to a store in San Diego who wanted to buy diamonds from the manufacturer in India, they'd see that and they'd, they'd see this amazing thing and they can already view and understand like, all right, well, this is a good diamond. It's worth the money. All right, I'm gonna ask them to ship it over. And so the next time they wanna buy a diamond, they're gonna already ask, for a Sigoma image, right? And so when you manage to create a demand from from, from upstream, um, it, it helps educate the market. And I can tell you like with our current business, like one of the things we're trying to do um, is, uh, we'll dive into it later on, but sort of like when you think about the world of, of lending and like many real estate investors, um, active real estate investors, when they want to apply for loans or stuff like that, they need to fill out, you know, personal financial statements, PFS statements and balance sheets and or whatever. And there's no standard for that, right? And so, if 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 in our if our platform, if you already have everything in it, and you want to generate a PFS, you just click a button, and there's a PFS, and then you can educate. All right, you don't have to do anything, and then that that might become a standard for generating personal financial statements and help people. Anyway, so that's sort of like, oh, you go to a lender. Hey, well, that's I want. No, I want the PFS from Visor. I don't want the PFS from your crazy spreadsheet, whatever you built like 20 years ago. Um, anyway, so yeah, so so I think building that demand. Um, bottom up is is also pretty helpful it's hard right but it's a yeah but it's it, it's it's an uphill but it's still though it, it works though it, you have to take in consideration that kind of both sides the up, upstream and the downstream and how it affects both of us and we see that definitely in the markets here in the real estate especially uh you, you, especially the last few years is all these i buyers of you know these virtual buyers are coming in and people investing not only from here in the united states outside of their own market but across the country across the ocean in a lot right. of cases of how data is evaluated, you know, how appraisals are figured out. It's not just a Zillow value. In a lot of cases, you've got to figure out, okay, what are comps and what are marketing? Uh, and then what are the numbers behind them? And we see that specifically in the, in the debt industry because a mortgage is not the property. You know, it's, it's a different evaluation of figuring, okay, the house is worth this, but what's owed and what's the likelihood of the borrower, you know, not performing or, starting to get back up if they've been non you know, non-paying and figuring exit strategies and of course when you have a, a national or world uh something bad happened like COVID that throws you know a lot of monkey uh, wrenches in the, in the machine to make things work so figuring a way to evaluate things and give everything a standard that everybody can have, agree to is often very difficult in a lot of cases totally so, so how did you, so what made you go from where you're at there you had your successful changing company you sell that company and then what led uh, to Visor? I mean, were you just sitting around, just bored off your ass? Like, okay, I sold a company. I got two kids. I'm playing Legos all day with my boys. <laughs> yeah. That kind of uh, um, So, so we, we sold a company back in 2015. We, we, we made a good deal and stayed on for a few more years to scale the business even more. Um, and in 2018, me and one of my co-founders decided to move on. Uh, but 
sort of the exit was in 2015. We made money. We didn't make tens of millions of dollars, but we made enough money. And sort of we decided to manage it on our own. And then when you have money and people obviously try to offer you their services to manage it, your money for you, we decided to do it on our own, really believing in the private markets more than the public ones. Um, and the cool thing in Israel is that everyone knows the guy, like everyone, everyone knows someone who does real estate or private equity or stuff like that abroad. And we just started to meet with friends and friends of friends and, and start to allocate funds into, um, into real estate in the U S in Europe and, and you know, into syndications and other types of funds. Um, and we also did two active real estate deals. Uh, we bought two single family homes in Ohio, which were, I mean, turned out to be really bad deals. And we got, we only got rid of them like a year or two, a year or two ago. And, and since those two deals, we decided just to do LP investing in syndications. Uh, and, and that sort of to evolve. And we did, you know, one, five, 10, 15 deals. And then which 30 deals. I mean, we, we, we've done a bunch of those deals over the past seven years. Um, and I, I pers from a personal uh, perspective, it's like, well, that is amazing because it's great passive income. You're really exposed to real estate and usually sort of the returns at least have at least have the potential to be phenomenal. Uh, and, you know, like IRR and refis and all that type of stuff, it, it, it comes out really well. Um, but one of the things we found is that over years, when you, when you allocate and diversify your portfolio, we, we've done, you know, about 30 something deals with 10 different operators over the years. And these are good problems to have, but, but at some point you reach just like, all right, this is hard to, to manage. Like our spreadsheets, yeah. be, our spreadsheets became insane and multiple <laughs> bank accounts and, and cash coming in. And like we reached levels where we received these updates, these quarterly updates from operators saying, Hey, this month, you're this quarter, you're going to receive this and this cash. And we're like, you know, scratch your head. Wait, how much did I invest in this? Right. Is this what I was supposed to receive? Is it like, all right. And, and even if I remember at that point, then only a month, a week or two later, it's going to be in my bank account. And I'm going to go through the whole process again. Like, Hey, wait, what's this? And again, these are good. I, I can't complain. These are good problems to have. Right. But, <laughs> but, but, um, but they're still like, and, and, and we really believe in passive income. Yep. I don't want to be active. I want to be passive. I don't want to trust people that they're going to make more money. They're not going to screw me over. They might, they might, I mean, things might happen market that, that happens. Right. But yep. I know that anyway, so at, at some point about two and a half years ago, me and my co-founder Tomer decided to build ourselves uh, for ourselves, just a piece of software. We, we hired an engineer and just like, all right, let's build something to automate a, a bunch of this process. And while doing so a bunch of friends and family wanted as well, we said, wait, wait, hold on. There might be, there might be a whole business potential here, business opportunity. And, you know, for we're tech, we're, we're, we're founders. We've we're like, all right, let, there's a problem. Let's see if we can solve it with tech. And, right. We started to research the world, speaking with like hundreds of people around the world, specifically in the U.S., and asking our right, people like us, right, what do you do? We found that millions of people like us that at the end of the day have to choose between either maintaining a spreadsheet or paying someone tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars a year to, to help them to manage their money. And, and usually it'll be a bookkeeper or something like that because wealth managers don't like to go into the private markets that much, especially if it's not deals they bring to the table. Yep. Again, I mean, when you reach, you know, the tens or hundreds of millions you have, you, you build your family office or that type of stuff. But for people that are, that have money and have that complexity, but don't have a solution that those are the people that we're trying to bring value and, and, and solve problems. For. And so that's sort of what led, what led to build advisor. Well, it, it's such a, a great thing because you're exactly right. When you have independent advisors who, uh, you know, you, you, the folks that work for the major firms, they don't want to mess with the, the you know, the the real estate deal that the investors are doing because they're not making commission on it, but they still can often figure out assets under management or bringing opportunities to the table to help their clients out. And sometimes they just don't because it, it's the visibility is not there in a lot of cases. How's that working? When's that going to pay out? When can we reinvest that into funds or op, you know options or whatever's going on in the market out there? It's not always a great conversation in a lot of cases, but that's you, you, you hit something on the head there. Those that have the money, the family offices, they get all their, you know, they got a you know staff of handling the numbers to take that. It's that middle area of, I don't say in America here, you know, really those folks that are under $10 million in value, you know, they've got real estate deals. They may be property rich and not quite cash, uh, cash rich yet, but they're working through the aspect of bringing in passive income and they're managing their other investments out there. But it is most of the time, like you said, it's a spreadsheet with sticky notes. <laughs> you know what totally. I mean? I've had people, I've had, uh, we've spoken, I've spoken, I can imagine I've spoken with hundreds of people. And there are people that, that put sticky notes, like, 
they don't know and then they, their their spouse will ask like where's our money and, and they'll go and they'll put sticky notes on the refrigerator or some other people like i mean that they, they, they have no clue because it's in their head i mean it's just like it's it's totally crazy and and these are people that the the the, the, the ironic part of this is that the people that are managing like really successful businesses yep. and they will never let the, their business run that way, but their personal life is totally berserk. Right. And, and so it's, it's, cause it's hard. Like people, I've also actually heard people that prefer not to, not to diversify their portfolio and invest with more people because of the hassle of tracking and managing it all. <laughs> um, <laughs> So well, but, anyway, but you know, it is when people, a confused mind is a, a mind that says no a lot of times and you've really taken the confusion. And I, I was extremely impressed with the platform and that's why we got you on here to talk about this because it's, it is, it really does a great job of marrying both sets of those investments so that you can really see everything in real time and keep up with it. and not a lot of, okay, what are we doing this week? You know, how are we making this thing works? You know, um, what, what what were some issues that you ran into initially that you worked to overcome uh, when you started? Advisor, yeah. So um, one of the things, so, so, I mean, there's so many issues, you know. When, when, when you build a startup, um, you sort of are, you have this problem you're trying to solve. And usually before you try to solve it, you want to understand, right, what other solutions are there for this problem? And at that point, when you go and you research the market, you see that if there are types of solutions, right, what can you do better that these solutions aren't doing, right? And, and at that point, um, you're like, all right, well, there are solutions. I mean, there's mint and personal capital and the likes of those types of companies, um, but they're not solving the, the, the problem for this specific industry of people that invest like in private markets or, or give like private lenders or stuff like that. And one of the one of the struggles is to even quantify how many people like this are there. How many people suffer from the problem that we suffer from? In, in, until today, we have we have tackled this from a bottom up and top down approach. So the top down approach is all right. You have to be an accredited investor usually to invest in these types of deals, or you don't have to. But there's some. But most people that do are, are accredited right. investors. Right. And so when you look and you when you look at accredited investors, it's about 25 million Americans that are accredited investors in the US, uh, Americans in the US, obviously, but yeah, so 25 million uh, um, Americans. And so that's, the, the, but, but obviously not all of them invest in these types of deals, right? They're people that are retired already that are accredited investors and all they have is a retirement account. And, and there are others that just like, prefer to have a wealth manager manage everything and maybe they have a house and a boat. They're not really, they, they don't have the same issues. And so when you then, the bottom up approach is sort of looking at, all right, people that raise money from people like us, how many of those exist? So in the U.S., and this is an insane number, that like 50,000 operators in the U.S., from people oh. that have 10, 10 investors to people that have thousands of investors. And so let's just say the median there is 100 investors per operator, sponsor, syndicate, or whatever you want to call it. So that's 5 million. So, I mean, anywhere between 5 to 25 million. And, and anyways, that's like the first. And, and I, I, there's, there are many, many challenges um, throughout the way. There are product challenges and there's fundraising challenges and, there's, you know, I mean, even security challenge, because for us, like, all right, someone for someone to to use Visor and upload or add all their information, their financial documents, and link in their bank account, they need to trust that we're secure and private, right? And so, conveying that is, is a big issue. And we actually pay hackers to try and hack us to make sure that we're we're like where we're vulnerable, if vulnerable if at all, and we fix that. And so, so the, there are a ton of challenges building a startup. But, but for me, it's like, all right, I feel that there's a real problem here that we're trying to solve. And so it's worth it. Yeah, no, totally. I, I agree with that. And the fact that you guys use hackers to find your weak spots is smart, but it's also, it's, it's, hey, how can we break this to make sure that it's working effectively? And a lot of folks don't do that in a lot of cases. They'll do some of it, but it's not the extent that you guys are doing to make sure everything, because you're right, you are providing a place for people to put the secure information to really marry bank accounts, accounting, uh, you know, deal flow and stuff like that out there on a regular basis for it. What's what's one aspect that you, what's a, a, a positive aspect of something you've heard from other folks out there that just, you're just really excited about. It's like a, a case study or somebody who's just like, oh my God, now your biggest raving fan. Uh, we have people say, listen, we waited our, 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 our entire adult life for, for something like this. And, but actually one of the cool, so we, we have, I mean, we haven't launched this aspect yet, but one of the things we're launching soon is the ability not just to see what you have, but to see what people like you are investing in anonymously. And so 
a cool aspect there is, you know, in these private markets, it's very hard to understand who the good operators are, yeah. who the good sponsors yeah. are. And if we can provide transparency there to the to the investors themselves, showing them, right, the, they're, this is the this is this and this operator, this and this fund, and there are 500 people and buyers that have invested in this fund. Here, you can talk to them directly, anonymously. So you can interact with other LP investors or other investors in these funds. And so I'm just giving that as, as sort of an anecdote because one of the things we've heard, which is amazing to me, is that we've had operators come to us and say, listen, I want all my investors to use Visor because I believe that our, our performance is amazing and I, want, I don't want it to come from me, but I want all my investors to use Visor so that it comes from them. And then we'll already have a track record when you launch the benchmarking side of it. So now that, that's mind blowing for us because first of all, it means that there are really good people out there that really believe that they should, that in transparency. And two, that that's a, for us, it's like a it's 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 sort of um, uh, one of those um, flywheel uh, aspects to building a company where you have it, it sort of it builds itself, which is really amazing. Um, so, yeah, I love that. I absolutely love it. Yeah, get that momentum going, and it really starts growing, and the word gets out. That's a beautiful thing. Now, I wanted to ask you a question when you you talk about your investments. And I'm, I'm, you know, what are some things that you look for in a good operator you're looking for when you're going to put your money into a deal? So this is very subjective to me, um, sure. but over the, over the years, um, and I'm giving that disclaimer because it's important because it doesn't mean it's right or wrong, but because I'm going to say things that not everyone will probably agree with. I prefer to invest with operators that are small. So, you know, when they, they don't have thousands or hundreds of, 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 of potential investors, because usually when they have that amount of investors, they need a very big team, oh. nice offices. They need to provide a ton of deal flow for those investors. And so every other week or every other month, they're going to send deal flow. And for me, that's 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 great. But at, at some point, it's just a numbers game. Some of those deals don't go, like not because bad or these are bad operators, but it's just a numbers game. Some of these things won't go as planned. And when you have such a big crew, you have a lot of overhead. And so I, I tend to prefer to invest in smaller operators, one, two men show, women show, whatever. Um, and yeah. and um, and when they do one or two de deals a year, they're like super hungry. Like they're going to make sure these deals are phenomenal. They're going to go like dive in and, and just be hungry to make sure these things like go through because it's all they have. And and the 10 or 20 or 50 investors they have in their pipeline, like want to make sure that they're happy. So those are obviously it's higher risk, right? Because these people you don't have the experience the big the big the big guns have. Um, so I I usually prefer to invest with smaller ones, more emerging managers. Um, I have like a bunch of questions I always ask now because I've learned lessons over the years that 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 you've seen that not everyone has the same answers to. Um, and it's really interesting to see how these operators answer those questions. Like one of the things that was really crazy for me is the whole element of refinance um in these deals and the the scenarios that can play out in different situations i don't know if you want to dive into that but that's yeah like... no it's, it's uh yeah it was gonna be my <laughs> let's dive into that because it was a question i was gonna ask there for you yeah for sure um so like in refi when you, when you invest as a limited partner in these deals um usually there are these like fundamental assumptions of the deal itself in terms of cash flow ongoing cash flow distributions at the exit event and all that and, and sort of our preferences and waterfalls and hurdles and all those like nice terminologies in real estate or, or in private equity in general. But but like when you when you look at um at refinance event, at one point I thought I invested I don't know hundred thousand into a deal and it was supposed to be a five or six year deal with a eight percent annual cash on cash distribution every quarter. So eight thousand dollars or two two thousand every quarter, eight thousand a year. And then after like a year or two um, out of the blue, we get seventy thousand dollars back as a refinance. We, we, now it's amazing, right? I mean, I mean, everyone wants to get their capital back, as even more so when it's sort of ongoing at the end. But then the question came up, right? Wait, but I got a hundred thousand. I got seventy thousand dollars back. I'm still thirty thousand in. Now, what about distributions? How does it work? Is it based on the original hundred or on the remaining thirty? And if it is, then how does the calculation work? Like. What if you return the entire hundred? Does that mean I don't get anything now? That doesn't make any sense because you're still profiting ongoing. Like there is ongoing profits and cash flow. Do I get part of that? And and so what I've seen is every op well not every operator. It's not it's not it's not an uh, uh, indefinite uh, um, 
possibilities, but every, almost all of them have different scenarios and different sort of ways they play that out. And that's a question I ask every operator now before I invest in a deal, not because it really matters. I mean, it does matter, but I want to know, but because you see their reaction. And mm -hmm. I've spoken with operators who don't even know the answer. They're going to go and say, oh, wait, you know what? I need, I, need, I need to go check that out. I need to think about it. We haven't thought of it. And so that, that says something. First of all, it says about the transparency of the operator. Maybe they're not, I mean, right, they need to check, which is fine. But also, wait, if they haven't been asked that before or they haven't checked that before, it means, wait, they, maybe maybe they're too new. Right. Maybe they haven't. So that's like one aspect of it that, that was really sort of, for me, um, an interesting aspect to ask. And I think everyone should ask that question because it's important. And then also, there's an incentive behind this. Many operators are incentivized to give you cash back as soon as possible. Because that, first of all, it increases the IRR on paper, which is the calculation of like how much cash you return versus how much you put in. Second, because of the, there's a hurdle of into the waterfall. And I don't know. I mean, a hurdle needs to be explained, but there's a point where they say you, you're supposed to get 8% annualized return. And then after that, there's a split between the, the right. limited partners and the operator, let's say 70%, 30 towards the, the investor or 80, 20 or 50, 50, whatever. Once they return all their capital, every distribution from that point on already reaches the first hurdle really fast until they get profit from the gate. And also it's important, it's not bad. I think operators should make money. It's really important they profit. It's really important, but um, it's another thing to take into account. Anyway, so I'm blabbering on about that, but, but yeah. No, it's a good question, too, because I always think we see have seen so many deals come across there, especially here in the United States. Apartments have been a crazy, you know, oversaturated. Everybody's, you know, buying apartments, buying apartments. And the, the idea that they're going to, oh, we're going to have it. We're going to regentrify. It's going to boost rents. And in three years, we're going to refinance out. You know what I mean? And I laugh. I was like, oh, you're basing three years in the future off of rates today. What happens if it's not no longer a low rate? It's a higher rate and everything. So what is your strategy for that? And you're exactly right. They're like, uh, just we got to figure that out. And that's super important for current times, right? Because rates are going up. And I, I'm one of the pessimists to believe they're going to even go up higher, faster. Um, but yeah, totally valid question. And, and, and operators that say that it's going to be exactly the same as it was a few years ago, they're not sort of connected to what's happening in the market, right? Yeah, and that's that, you know that comes with experience, but I, I really do believe that you're right. You're, okay, you if you go with a big operator, they've got a ton of investors that you become a number, and yeah, if they're doing ten deals, you know, ten or hundred deals, and there's going to be a percentage that don't go the way that they should, and then your smaller smaller operators have a lot less overhead, which is an expensive number when you have to have nice offices and you're constantly an investment, uh, uh, you know. Uh, an investment rep was constantly going out and raising capital to put stuff in. There's things that can go wrong pretty quickly that, you know, especially when we look at what happened here the last two years with office rents and things shutting down. Well, right. that doesn't mean, that doesn't mean, you know, your rent's not going to have to be paid in a lot of cases too for you. I, I, I feel, but I do feel sort of that I have to give the flip side of it, that sort of debate because I have heard the other side of, of that equation. And the other side is, well, you look at these huge operators and the advantage of their, they have an advantage. First of all, they get really access to really, really good deals. Yep. Before, because because they have buying power and you know people that they, they have reputation like Black BlackRock or Blackstone and Cake like these companies like they'll get really good deals and they have really because of all the experience they have they can probably vet or do their DD a lot better more like efficiently on these so I mean there is a flip side of that um, there's an you know and, and any anyone who deals in in personal finance and investing always will say there's always the psychological aspect of investing right and so for me i like to be closer to the people i invest with yeah no i totally agree well and blackstone just recently had two funds they just pulled within house i had a horrible aspect because they overpaid for so many so much real estate right. above and beyond that the rental was the you know just that bomb nobody's talking about that it was really funny when they had that happen like a week later they announced a new fund and some other things they were going after <laughs> <laughs> just, yeah you, you gotta it, stay up to date what asset classes uh, are you looking at? Because uh, I know that uh, Visor can do just about anything because you're basically getting numbers in, but what's a, what's an asset class or two that you're really kind of bullish on right now? Yeah, I mean, so I think until now, I've been really, so I, most of my investments are multifamily value add type deals in the US. I've also done some ground up development in the US and Europe, some flips, uh, storage units. Um, I have to say now what I'm looking into is totally 
the, another side of it, which is more industrial stuff, warehouses, yeah. factories. Um, so I've been looking into that. I haven't, I haven't invested in any of those uh, types of deals yet, but, but um, I think that that's, I mean, and also one of the things I've also been looking at farmland, which is yeah. also an asset class. There aren't, there aren't many syndicators in any of those um, industries or classes as much as there are in multifamily and like ground right. development. Um, but, but yeah, that, that's what I'm looking at now. I think because when you look at like, I, again, because I believe that there is like rates are going to go up and there is a recession ahead. Um, that those are the, those, those in my mind are sort of, again, this is just me, the con, not a financial professional, just like thinking like, what are the good hedges to, but against like that type of situation? Yeah, no, I think you'd have to probably reach out to Bill Gates. who's the largest landowner here in the United <laughs> yeah. States down as much as he's buying up for right. his funds and stuff like that. But that's, you know, I think you hit some very valid points there for you. And, and what's great, though, is beans have different options, different focus and different knowledge. I mean, one of the, I think the biggest thing is always to learn about what you're investing in and have uh, understand the the risk with everything. Because it's investments and investments, not a guarantee in, in a lot of places out there. Uh, what do you see? Uh, and this is a big question from your existing clients that are using Visor right now. How much of it is a mix of your traditional stock portfolios, bonds, stuff like that, and then a mixture of uh, syndications or other private real estate? Do you see kind of an average percentage or is it all over the place? And you may not know that number, but just, just curious off the top of your head if you know. Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. I also think we're pretty biased towards um, the private investors more. So sure. our, our, our members tend to have a larger percentage in the private markets and real estate and private equity and startups and crypto as well obviously all of like all of us have public portfolios as well but the, i think across the board the vast majority are in those private markets and real estate specifically but not not only any type of figuring an average of uh is it 50 50 you see this percentage or i mean it's very a little bit but anything to, to kind of surprise you on that i think it's more 70 30 towards real estate and private equity Okay, that's interesting. Now that's that's kind of yeah. what I would. I, I've figured it'd be a little bit more than fifty, but yeah, seventy thirty is not a surprise, um, especially with where the markets are at. And but here's a great thing: when markets are down, there's a lot of opportunity uh, to take advantage of, of what's going in the market out there. Now, um, one of the things I, I'd like to ask you, advisor, you, you've talked about accredited investors out there, people that are sophisticated. What advisor isn't for? Is there a, a person out there that's just getting started investing is probably not the right spot for it, or is there? You know, you got that mixture of in the middle, like you talked about, who's kind of on that lower end that's transitioning into using it? What's, what, what would you say is the, uh, a good starting spot for somebody with Visor? So I think I think once you, you have, um, I'd say, four or five passive income generating investments, um, that's when when you want to keep it keep it passive and you need you need a system for that. Um, and until you reach that point, maintaining a spreadsheet or using those budgeting apps is probably good enough. As we move forward and we add the aspect of benchmarking, then even people that want to go into this field of investing in those types of deals will probably see a lot more value as well because then they'll get better knowledge based around who the good operators are and where they should invest based on other people and also interact with people that are like them or, or interested in that type of stuff. So I think people that that and all they have or all their focus on at the moment is the public markets, like their their four hundred one k and 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 um and sort of like really getting started with building their wealth, probably isn't isn't for them yet. Um, but once they reach that point where they're interested in in, in the more sophisticated types of product, that's when it is. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, I, I'm 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 excited about Visor. I love what you guys are doing and marrying the two. It makes it very easy to read, add things, take away. Uh, excited, full disclosure, we're having uh, you on the note, uh, note Night in America here, here relatively soon on Monday night to demo, you know, share with it with our audience out there because it's such a valuable thing. We have such a, a great mixture of investors that uh, listen to the podcast, that tune in, that are both passive and active, but also have a, a mixed portfolio of, of traditional investments and a mixture with the real estate side of things. And so uh, when I, I was just blown away because it really does marry it up. It's such a, a great, great tool uh, for folks to really know where the hell their portfolio truly is at versus trying to throw a, a dart against a dartboard to figure things out. Yeah, it's, exactly. I mean, and it's, it's like showing where it is at today, where it was at the past and where it will be in the future as well. It's also a really important thing that people don't put enough emphasis on. Like, yeah. 
like when you look at cash flow, when you have multiple streams of income or expenses coming in and going out, it's very hard to project forward. Like understand like, where am I going to be three years from now? Is it good to give this loan now or to invest in this asset? Like how will that affect my cash flow moving forward? And many, many people in our situation find themselves cash poor, although they're, they're yeah. worth a lot of money, but they're cash poor. And then they have a capital call coming up and whatever, and they don't have a way. So yeah. it's like, that's a really important aspect. So it's also the forward looking approach, which is really important for us. Yeah, I mean, we always have to be looking forward and most folks just looking where they're at today and trying to figure things out. I mean, hey, it shows I'm positive. I, I, we made profit, but where's the money? It's in that, there's no money in the bank right. account. How'd that work out? You know what I mean? Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Um, what's the best way for our audience out there to connect with you and, and follow you and stuff like that? I mean, you got, you're a, you an avid Lego builder out there with your sons on the, and you're, you're in Italy right now. To what part of Italy are you you're hanging on it? Yeah, we're on we're on a holiday up in northern Italy, um, in the Lake District. So we're in Garda Lake at the moment. Um, I was actually last week I was in Bigger Pockets in San Diego. Yep. We had yep. we had a we had a booth there, and now we're here. And then I'm flying back out to the states in two weeks as well to another conference. But we're in we're in Italy now, and then we're going back to Israel after that. So, and if people want to reach out to me, like I'm pretty, I'm I'm really available. Like on almost all the social media like platforms, Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook. You can reach out via email and. We can share all the details afterward. Um, and me and my team are super available also on our on visor. Um, so yeah, totally open, listening, like hearing people, what they think, what they're feeling from our product and whatever we can help with. Yeah, you got you got an amazing team that that is really second to none. He's great communication and reaching back out and is and is very open to feedback and, and tweaking things or showing and, and walking people through the, the platform. And that's that platform once again, guys, is visor v y z e r dot c o. That's visor dot c o. Highly encourage you to check it out. If you're part of a syndication or uh, you know, talk with the sponsors, talk with the manager partner, because this is a great tool for you guys to use, be able to keep track of where everything's at and going and adds, I think it adds a level of sophistication versus that old spreadsheet and email aspect that it's out there for most folks. A hundred percent. But Dan, thank you so much for coming on the Note Closed Show. We look forward to seeing you on Note Night in America here shortly and uh, have a great vacation out there and, and uh, it'll get some, have some, drink some good wine for me while you're out there. Huh? <laughs> totally, man. I appreciate it. This has been awesome. Thanks so much. Thank you. All right, guys, check it out. Visor.co uh, is a great tool great software for you guys that are both active and passive investors with your own stock portfolio and real estate investing you heard it here go check it out visor.co you will not be disappointed i believe it's a tool that's going to revolutionize uh private equity out there and syndications in the in the reporting stuff so go check it out and we'll see you all at the top everybody bye